All right, welcome everybody to an episode of Living Objectivism. And I, I think I said this last week, I'm going to be dedicating quite a few of these shows to uh, interviewing objectivist intellectuals. And I'm really, really pleased and, and happy to be uh, to have Ilan Juno on the line today with us. And we're going to talk about Ilan's uh, latest book. Um, Ilan, for those of you who don't know, is a fellow uh, at the Ayn Rand Institute. He's also the director of policy research. Um, he has his latest book, which we'll be talking about today, is What Justice Demands, America and Israeli-Palestinian, Con the, um, the America and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. Oh my God. Um, and uh, he's also a co-author of Failing to Confront Islamic Totalitarianism, which came out in 2016, which is a book of essays. He contributed essays to Defending Free Speech, which, which also came out in 2016. And of course, as the editor and, uh, and co-author of a number of the articles and author of a number of the articles in Winning the Unwinnable War, which was published in 2009. And Ilan and I co-authored one, one of those articles in, uh, in Winning the Unwinnable War. Uh, but we've worked a lot on foreign policy issues over many, many years. Uh, Ilan was at the Institute when I arrived, so he, he's been there for over 18 years now. So hi, Ilan. Hi, thanks for having me, Iran. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, part of the original work that Ilan and I did going back to really 2002, 2001, 2002, was work that we did together on, um, on Israel. On, on, uh, on Ilan helped me write many of my talks on Israel, on um, the morality, the moral case for Israel, a number of them up on YouTube and, and various, uh, various uh, uh, places. But Ilan now has a book, a book on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, What Justice Demands. So, so tell me a little bit about the, the actual the title for the book. So the book is trying to approach this super complicated subject that's highly controversial, but approach it from a perspective that I think is distinctive, and that is an objectivist analysis. So I bring a secular individualist perspective that uh, I think helps to really shed light on the essential nature of the conflict and the core question, which I think a lot of people, uh, this is part of what is at the core of the debate in, in America today and in the Western, uh, Western Europe, which is what should our approach be to this conflict? Because I think it's an understatement to say the battle lines have been drawn for many years and there's the pro-Israel side, there's the pro-Palestinian side, there's people who think you can bridge the two. And, and the book basically says this conflict seems geographically distant, but it, it isn't. I mean, it really intersects with our political, cultural scene. It's a flashpoint on college campuses around, uh, around the world. And it intersects with the Islamist movement in many ways that people recognize. And so the, the basic question is, well, what should our approach be? Uh, and, and that you know, takes a whole book to answer that. But the basic issue is I put justice in the title and I, I frame it that way because I think it, this isn't a technical policy question. This isn't how do we restructure an existing approach with tweaks, which is the way it's commonly understood. You know, what are the variables in the peace uh, peace process that we need to tweak, which is sort of the, the common refrain. Instead, it's, it's a moral reappraisal or a moral analysis, a philosophical perspective on a political cultural issue. And, and uh, to me, the, the central uh, moral uh, uh, principle that's relevant here is justice, like evaluating both sides and America's role in it, because America has had a significant role as people recognize. So it's a, it's a moral reassessment of the, both the debate and then sort of the, the real issue uh, and what's at stake for us, because that's also debated. People think this is the biggest issue uh, in foreign policy, and then other people say, well, this is irrelevant. Who cares? Let them fight themselves to death and, and you know, screw it. And I think both of those are wrong, but it is, it's still true that it's a very important issue, and that's part of what I try to explain in the book. Sure. So... so what is really framing the whole discussion of the book is this idea of justice in, in the idea of, of what is right. And um, so how much, 
How much of the history do you get into in the book? Uh, you know, because because people argue they started it, they started it. You know, this massacre happened, that massacre happened. To what extent do you think the history is important, and to what extent do you get into the history in the book? So I would say the book is about the conflict as it exists today, and I go into the history only to the extent that I think an objective observer needs some of the background to understand how we got to today. It's not a history book. There are a lot of books that analyze the history in you know, as whatever level of detail you really want to get into. And as you point out, practically every feature of the history is debated and, and controversial. And there's, there's you know, things that you would as an outsider think, well, this is an obvious thing. It's like it's a numerical figure. How many people were made refugees in 1947? Like it's a, it seems like it's, well, it's a, it's a math question. And it's not. It, there's a debate. Uh, among a, m- a number of scholars that have been has been going on for like 25 years. So, I'm I, I, what I've done in the book is I bring in some history as I think it's necessary, and I use sources that I think are credible. Uh, and people can dispute some sources, and that's fine. But the, the, the argument doesn't hinge on a specific account of the history. It hinges on a moral assessment of the adversaries. And the adversaries have shifted. And we, you know, there's a lot of people to talk about. So th- there's a reason to explain the backstory of the conflict. And I should say that um, the, the, you could, you, how you divide the history is itself a question. So do you go back to the late 19th century when you know, some, set, some Zionists came along and started settling in Israel? Or do you start it? And what basically the decision I made in the book is to the pivotal point is 1948, 1947, 1948. Yep. I say a little bit about what led up to that. For the people who don't know the history, 1947, 48 is, is basically when Israel became independent of the British mandate. Uh, and then there was a massive war. And then, and then so that's sort of the cascade. Yeah, of- I mean, it, it, I once, I think I once sent a, a talk I gave on Israel to uh, Netanyahu and uh, Bibi Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel. And he responded and he sent me back his book and his basic complaints about my talk was that we, I didn't go further back, that you really should go back to the Bible, he says, right. because Jews have always been in the land of Israel and God promised it or whatever. So, so yes, there's always this debate on how, how far back you go. And certainly the, the, some of the Israeli nationalists uh, would like us to go back to the Old Testament. I'm not sure what they gained by that exactly, other than maybe Israel belongs to Philistines, um, you know, whoever they are. So um, let's start with this, because I think this is probably um, probably the most I- Im- important question for the audience that we have right now. Why should anybody care? So, so why should an American who has got, you know, we, we, free speech is under attack and we've got Islamic terrorists to, to worry about and we've got Trump and a massive budget and all the nonsense that is happening out of Washington. Why should this rise up and, and, and catch your attention? Why is this something that Americans should be reading now, right now? And of course, Europeans as well, because we've got a lot, of, a lot of listeners from Europe and Asia and Africa and everywhere else. So why should anybody in South America, I shouldn't forget that. Why should anybody around the world care? I think the answer is that the, this conflict is not essentially about two groups of people fighting over one piece of land, which is how it's often understood. It is much wider than that. It is a conflict between what is essentially a free society and various movements and causes that are hostile to human life and freedom. And that's been true for the last 70 years in different forms and different shapes. So that's essentially, it's a battlefront for anyone who's concerned with freedom and human progress and human life fundamentally. So that's sort of the big picture context. And one of the major groups in this conflict is the Islamist movement. So the same goals that Al-Qaeda and ISIS have are the goals of Hamas and Islamic Palestinian, Islamic Jihad, and all of the groups that would want to lead the Palestinian movement. And so the Palestinian movement has become a subset of the Islamist movement globally. And of course, Al-Qaeda. So if you look at Osama bin Laden's publications, one of his earliest uh, letters to the world was 
the Palestine question, how we must use that to rise up against the West. So they view it as a battlefront, and it really is a battlefront in that respect. Then a secondary issue is that America has been neck deep in this conflict, and that has been a significant problem. Uh, and I mean that in the sense that my view of America's role in the conflict is that it was a rational policy that we pursued. And we, in, you know, the goal was to solve it, right? For the last 25 odd years, we've been pursuing what's called the peace process, which is bringing the Palestinian and Israelis together for negotiations. The outcome of that approach, which I talk about in the book, is it's actually made the conflict way worse than it was before, whether you measure it in terms of the, the, the amount of fighting, the death tolls, and sort of the, the moral dimension of the encouragement to the Palestinian cause and Islamists more generally. So America has created, has been involved in this conflict in a deep way. It's made our Middle East, situ our interest in the Middle East much sort of more imperiled. And then sort of if you want to zoom out and look at the Middle East in general, a lot of people in the foreign policy establishment or sort of the, the people who work in this field have a view that the conflict is central to the whole region's upheavals. And now yeah. that's a... Peace on earth, if not for the Israeli-Palestinian right. conflict, yes. Right. Now, that view is much less credible these days if you've paid attention to Syria or if you've paid attention to Egypt, because, you know, the, the Syrian uprising that became a civil war had very zero to do with Israel-Palestine. And the Egyptian Arab Spring had nothing to do with Israel-Palestine. But that view that the conflict... Well, the is, war in Yemen and, right. and the, the, you know, the civil war 20, 30 years ago in Algier and the conflict in Morocco, and, you know, it just goes on and on and on. The idea is so ludicrous, it's never had any currency. I mean, it, it, well, it, it, it's never been plausible, I think, if you understand it, but it has, the, the problem is that it has currency That's right. That's um, right. in the sense that it's animated American policy. And so it's given the conflict a kind of... Um, uh, but I do think it's important to the region. So if you want to understand the region, you have to understand that the rise of Islamists is integral to this conflict. The, yeah. the conflict is not separable from that. And how American policy has approached this conflict has had an impact on the Islamists. So I'll give you one sort of concrete. Um, the, uh, the, the Bush years, George W. Bush. So he's seen as the most pro-Israel president in recent memory. Maybe Trump is going to eclipse him in some people's minds because of the things he's done over Jerusalem as the capital. But for a long time, Bush has been the most pro-Israel president. Bush, as you, I mean, you know this, but I think the audience needs to hear that Bush's policy of bringing elections to the Middle East impacted the Israeli-Palestinian conflict by putting the Islamist resistance movement known as Hamas to most people in power, basically, in Gaza and supercharged them in a way that led to several wars in this conflict. So there's many dimensions to the way in which America has interest in the region from the perspective of- Riling on Bush, can I add to that? Go ahead. <laughs> because, you know, my favorite topic, other than going after Trump, I think, but, but going after Bush is not only did he promote democracy and bring about Hamas and ultimately, I think, led to the Arab Spring and all the negative consequences that have come from that, but I think- but also he, he prevented Israel from being tough. So he weakened Israel. And I remember at least two, maybe three situations in which in those days, Arik Sharon, who was, you know, relative to Israeli prime ministers was sometimes tough, surrounded Yasser Arafat's compound. And, and, and you could imagine him wanting to kill Arafat. And you could, could imagine that going through Arik Sharon's mind and him getting phone calls from Bush saying, you can't touch him. You cannot do it. And, and what, what message does that send to the world at the same time as we're supposedly fighting terrorism, at the same time as he post 9-11 and all of that, the weakness that that projects to the world. And, and, and this from the most Israeli-friendly president supposedly ever. So just to flesh out your, your account, so this happened in 2002, and there literally was a phone call. Don't yeah. touch him. If you touch him, you're in trouble. So this is 2002 before the rise of Hamas. And what's relevant is what people might not realize is 2002 was the, the ramping up of a um, terrorist war within Israel led by Arafat. And we, we have documentation. This isn't a, it was out of his control. This was, he's directing it. And he was, he had a shipment of ammunition, like 80 tons of ammunition that was um, uh, intercepted 
heading to, so he was waging a war and here's President Bush saying, you know, here are the handcuffs, put them on yourself and don't take any further action against this guy who is sort of, if you want a counterpart, he's sort of the bin Laden within this conflict. You know, if America was facing a bin Laden and this jihadist broadly. So to sum up the, the point, why, who cares about this? Well, whether you care about it or not, the Middle East cares about you. You know, I hate to quote, uh, to paraphrase Trotsky, but there's something to that point. The Middle East, the, the jihadists are involved in this conflict. We've done things in our irrational policy that have made it worse, and it, it sort of elevated the significance of the conflict. But then if you, what's distinctive to, I think, what our context brings is if you really care about freedom and human life and progress, independent of the conflict, there's one country in that region that deserves your attention, which is there's things to learn about it. So Here's Israel, and there's a lot of faults and flaws to it, and I talk about those in the book, but there's one thing that I think is important. Government is a necessary good, and Israel has created a society that is essentially free in a region that isn't just mediocre free, that isn't just mixed economy free, that is actually run by monarchs, dictators, and theocrats, and that, uh, whose, whose goal in, in, in running a country isn't I mean, it's, it's basically methodically to subordinate and exploit people and kill them, enslaving people, basically. So here you have a region where there's actually a virtuous country in the sense of political virtue, of creating a free society, and it's prospered. It's not just a, so it's a, it's a demonstration of the value of freedom in a region that solely needs it. And, you know, American presidents have spoken for a century about we stand with those who stand for freedom, but they don't. And here's an opportunity that calls out for using freedom as the principle. So this is part of what the book argues. This is the framework to use to guide you. Who's, who's really stands with freedom, regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of all those things. And that's how you should shape your approach. And that includes anyone in the Arab world and the Palestinian world who really cares for freedom. They deserve your attention. And then when you, when you add on top of that, that their enemies are... Islamic totalitarians who are trying to exter- like stamp out human freedom and prosperity. Okay, well, to me, that draws a bright line in the sand. You know, it, it's clear what you need to understand here. Yeah, so, so you're saying there are two reasons people should really understand the conflict. One is because it, they, we share an enemy, and the enemy is Islamic totalitarian uh, Islamism that, that is clearly trying to kill Americans and has killed Americans. and. Westerners, generally Europeans, and and this is a conflict going on really all over the world. And second, and and this is something we need to talk more about, if you care about freedom, then you should care about places where freedom is threatened, and you should care about defending those societies, those cultures, those governments, those countries that are free against uh, barbarism. So this is an opportunity to educate yourself about, about freedom and, and about the threats to freedom. And, and um, so let's talk a little bit about that, because to, to me, this is m- maybe one of the most stunning things about the whole Israeli-Palestinian issue is that is the extent to which people are anti-Israel and the extent to which they hate Israel. And you see that, I see that particularly when I travel to Europe, but I see it in the U.S. among libertarians of all people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and who claim to be pro-freedom, and then a pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel. So let's let's just do f- just facts, right? What is life like basically in Israel? What is life like basically under the Palestinian Authority? Well, what life is like under the Palestinian Authority or under Gaza is is essentially cut from the same cloth as you would get in Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt. Jordan, basically it's tyrannical. So there is no freedom of speech. If you go on Facebook and you criticize Mahmoud Abbas, who is the so-called president of the Palestinian Authority, you will get thrown in jail or taken to court and, and punished. This actually happened just a few months, you know, a year or two ago, a journalist was criti- didn't criticize him harshly. He just ridiculed him. You cannot do that. If you are gay, God help you. Because if your neighbors don't come after you, the, one of the security forces, because they have a whole bunch of gangs fighting for whose territory is what, they'll come after you. And some of them have become, uh, have sought ref- they've, they've, they've sought to be asylum seekers within Israel. They've fled the Palestinian Authority. 
If you're a woman, well, under Hamas, you, you're made to, to don a veil and you are, if you're a man, you're made to grow a beard. And so they've brought in the morality police that you see in Saudi Arabia, in Iran. Even Egypt has its own kind of morality police that people don't know enough about. So these are societies that are highly controlled. I mean, the, the idea that Mahmoud Abbas is the president of the Palestinian Authority, well, he's deferred the elections. He's in the 13th year of a four-year term. It's ridiculous. I mean, this is an authoritarian regime where your life is in control by the state. I mean, the, it is incredibly controlled. What and about economic of, freedom, like, like property rights? Are there property rights in, in the, the Palestinian Authority? The, they belong to those who have a gun. So if you have a nice villa and somebody wants it and who belongs to the Palestinian Authority, they'll come in and they'll take your house. They'll take your car in the street. So this is a regime where they're not concerned about the Palestinians' rights. They're concerned about exploiting people and gaining territory and conquest. And one of the things that is typical of authoritarian regimes and, and tyrannies in general is economic exploitation, which is just a feature of you know, they believe they should control. And the amount of money that has flowed into the Palestinian Authority is breathtaking. It's roughly about 400 million a year just from the U.S. In the first five years of the Palestinian Authority, they got like $2.6 billion in front of it. Where has it gone? A lot of it went to oh, ammunition and oh, training. You know, we know when Arafat died, right. he had, what, a billion, over a billion dollars in a Swiss bank account? So these are not regimes that are designed to, uh, I mean, it's an understatement, but these are regimes that are methodical in their oppression of individuals. Like the idea that we, ha we have real problems with free speech in the United States, but we still have a free press, even if the president would like it to be otherwise. There is no free press in the Middle East, in the Palestinian territories or in Gaza. There is one place that is different. And, that, and so we can turn to Israel. Yep. Um, so in Israel, there is real freedom of speech. There is real property rights. There's intellectual property rights. And economically, I mean, so, so in, in every dimension, if you're a woman, if you're gay, I think of all the minorities, religious minorities. You, if you're a Christian, so there are some Christians who live under the Palestinian Authority. There aren't that many anymore because they've been, they've been persecuted out. And just as they've been persecuted out of Egypt and, and other countries in the Middle East. But Israel has a thriving community of Christians, a thriving movement, a community of Muslims of various sects, regardless of what which you are. And you know that the sectarian fighting among Muslims is, is crazy. And that's a big part of what's going on in Syria. There's a community of um, a religious minority called the Baha'i. They originated in Iran. But in Iran, you can't really live as a Baha'i because the government has made it its project to persecute you. And so, But in Israel, the Baha'i temple in Haifa, where you grew up, is is a landmark for tourists to come and see. So the, the idea of religious freedom and intellectual freedom is it's just an unheard of outside of Israel's borders, but it's a real phenomenon within the country. Um, so in every dimension that matters for human life and what options you have to live and pursue your own life according to your judgment, you actually have the, the ability to do that in Israel. And, and that's to whether you're a Jew or an Arab or Christian or Baha'i. It is. And you can see that in, it, that's the fundamental. So it's, it's kind of paradoxical that they, Israel calls itself the Jewish state. And it is in important ways. It has religion that sort of, it's a significant part of the way they, they've conceptualized their government and their country. But that's not anything like what it means to be Saudi Arabia, which is a Muslim state. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not the law of the land in the same way. And they actually have religious freedom for people who are not Jews. And what it means to be a Jew is also itself kind of a, a big package because a lot of Israelis that I know and that you know and that predominate are not religious in the way that the Hasidic Jews are. And so it's a remarkably atheist secular country that leans left, uh, that has incredible political freedom. And so one of the manifestations of that materially is the extent to which Israel is a it is, economically, it is a powerhouse in the region. It's tiny. It doesn't have the natural resources that you see, like petroleum, in the rest of the a lot of the other countries. But what it has distinguished itself with is through high tech and through biotech and the number of startups in Israel. It's been dubbed the startup nation. It's not an accident. There's a real ethos of entrepreneurialism in Israel. It's been there for, for decades. It isn't just with the dot-com uh, development. 
And that, when you zoom out and you see that, so there's real political freedom, intellectual freedom, and economic freedom. Now, it could be freer, right? Sure, but, much freer, yeah. But, but relative to its neighbors, and even relative to parts of Europe and, and, and certain uh, uh, sectors in the U.S., you can see that the manifestation of those kinds of freedoms leads to greater prosperity. Um, th so that I think the number of companies from Israel that are listed on NASDAQ, so the, the, the priority is the U.S. has the most, then China, then Israel. And that's yep. crazy. I mean, it's yep. relative to proportion. Tiny little country. And you can also look at the number of scientific articles that are generated per capita, the number of Nobel laureates in the actual hard sciences and in the fields that are not as politicized. So in all these respects, you have a society that is actually, there really is freedom. Now, I would love it to be greater freedom, but still, it's freedom. And that is an achievement. Like if you think of all the other countries that were started in the 20th century that became independent, where have they, where have they ended up? Like just to, by that measure, but just in world historical scale, like achieving a free society is a, an amazing achievement. No, I, I, I want to second that. I mean, the, the, the fact that in, the, in 60 years, what Israel has achieved, given the odds, given the wars, given the threats, given the hundreds of millions of Arabs uh, and Muslims surrounding it that, that want to annihilate it. Uh, and, and what they have achieved in terms of a thriving economy, in terms of startups, in terms of science, in terms of a free society, uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, in, in, in really in every respect. Now, I'm a huge critic of Israel, and yeah. part of why I don't live there, right? But to, you have to put it in, in historical and in, in global perspective. This is a massive, massive achievement. It is a huge achievement of human ingenuity and hu a huge achievement of reason and, and, and of, of you know, hard work and, and, and commitment. So, uh, you know, and, and for people to, to criticize it on, on stupidity is it, it just, you know, evading the, all, the, all the greatness that has been achieved is just absurd. All right, so there's, there's this historical claim, so we're going to have to get into history because people are going to raise this. Okay, but didn't the Jews just steal the land, right? Didn't they, didn't they show up there? This was Arab land. Um, it was owned by Arabs, and they came in in the late 19th century, early 20th century, all the, and then in 48, of course, and steal all the land. And isn't this really uh, just a, um, you know, a country based on massive theft, yeah, so I have a whole chapter that uh, unpacks this claim. And so what we can do in this conversation is just going to give people a high points of what is involved in this issue. Sure. I think factually, that's not accurate at all. In fact, for the evidence I've seen in looking at this is that where they came in, they bought land. So, to, so one of the things people don't realize is that um, so in the early 20th century, the area was still under the Ottoman rule. And what the Ottomans had done for the previous 50, 60 years was try to bring in some semblance of land, uh, property and land, like to formalize it, like let's have deeds, let's have a registry. And their motives were, were to do with taxation and, and, ex and, and conscription, but essentially they created some of the beginnings of property rights. And what you see is that the, the big influx of, uh, Zionists, who, so Zionism is the movement to create a, a, a country for Jews. Um, when they started coming in, they, they founded organizations and they bought land, both individually and through these organizations. And a huge amount of foreign capital came in. And what you see is that a lot of the landowners were falling over each other to sell the land. And yep. that's significant. Now, you, the, the idea that it was stolen is that okay if you find someone who acquired land in, improperly okay that's a problem we, you, and there's things to do about that but the the predominant pattern of acquiring land which even critics of israel and even people on the palestinian side acknowledge is that it was purchased and to the extent that there was purchasing it was it created a boom such that it really raised the price of land and it was sort of generating more demand the other thing that's relevant to this is so what the argument is sometimes put as it's, well, it's not, okay, so it wasn't stolen, but they bought the land and they dispossessed the people who lived on. Now, that's a different kind of issue. Yeah. So what does it mean to dispossess someone? It means to take what is theirs improperly. It's acquire, to, like, there's some wrong involved in acquiring it. Now, 
that gets us into kind of a, a really uh, detailed historical issue that I deal with in the book. But what I would say in this conversation is there were people who aren't happy about the fact that they were tenant farmers. And as a result of their landlord selling the land or not giving them a chance to buy it themselves or they being so indebted, they couldn't afford not to sell. Yeah, I could see them being upset, but that's not theft. That is, that's an after, that's an effect of, well, there's a, an economic transaction and you have to accommodate yourself. But, the, but let me just say one kind of wider point about this. This issue is solve, like you can get to the facts of this, but what's really driving it, I think, is the idea that being a peasant farmer, whether you have title deed or not, is that you have some claim to the land by, you know, heredity, tradition, religion, and, and that's part of the argument. But that's not a perspective that you can take if you're pro-individual, pro-freedom. What really matters is the principle of property rights. But that's, that, I think, is at the heart of it. I think all these attacks on the Jews stole the land are coming at it from a purely collectivistic perspective, mm -hmm. right? The people who owned the land before happened to be Arabs, you know, eth ethnic Arabs. And the people buying the land were, were Jews, but the land belonged to Arabs, Arabs as a nation, as a collective, and suddenly there was this n different ethnic group, different collective entering the situation. It is completely collectivistic uh, approach to it. And of course, one of the things they ignore, uh, you know, in, in, is, is all the land that was not owned by anybody, right? The desert, the swamps, the, the land, and, and at that time it was under the Ottoman Empire. So it was government land, you could say, what does that mean? But the Jews drained the swamps. They actually cultivated the desert. They they did the stuff. So there was there's no there was no, there's no collective called Arabs that owns anything. Yeah. There are individual Arabs, and some of them sold the land to the Jews. In very very few cases did it happen, and usually and only during war, where where Arabs were forced off their land, you know, sent out, and. Uh, Jews replaced them on that land and took ownership on their land. It, it, unfortunately, it's, it still happens on the, West, on the West Bank where the state of Israel is confiscating the land of Arabs, not for military purposes, but for settlements and things like that. So those cases, I'd agree with the critics, but yeah. that's not the argument. The argument is Arabs own the land, a, a collectivistic story. Yeah, I mean, you're right. And I deal about with both of those kinds of issues because the contemporary situation is quite different. I mean, there's definitely things to say about that with the settlements and so on. But to go back to your point, which I think really bears emphasis, this idea of the collective of Arabs had rights to this land. And the, Now, one of the things that's really eye-opening is if you drill into the history, as I did as part of the research, and I bring some of this into the book, what, was, what were some of the reasons the people who were... Um, tenant farmers and so on, what were some of their rationales for being angry? Over and above what you might say is, well, I had, I had this piece of land that I was a tenant on and I, I, now I have to find other work, which you can understand, but you know, that's a solvable problem. Many of them found other work or comp and were compensated financially. Part of what was going on at the time, they we're now in the kind of prehistory of the conflict for people who want a kind of orientation, is that there was deep animosity toward the West. So it was not just that this is a collective. It's a collective that wants to stay, or many of them wanted to stay in the past. They don't want all this technology. They don't want the factories. They don't want agriculture that's scientific. They just want to pull the plow with an ox or with a donkey, and they want to stay in the past. And you get these really, um, in really kind of um, essentialized accounts of what it is that they were angry about. And it was these Westerners are coming with their Western ways, and the science that they're bringing and this kind of uh, uh, equality between men and women, well, who wants that? We don't want them. If they're going to make, Tel Aviv was one of the first cities that the, the, the settlers created when they founded the country, <coughs> when they were building the foundations of the country. And it was sort of a Western, it's sort of like a, a Manhattan on the ocean uh, for that part of the world. And part of what people disliked about it and other new cities was it's a city, it's not a village. Yeah. And so if you think about what that means, it's, yeah, the, the big part of the conflict at that time was we don't, we don't want all these Western ways. You're, you're, you're scaring us. We don't, and, and, but realizing that their standard of living was elevating, their, their, their pro ability to prosper was growing. And even just, just medical wise, like if you look at the, the, um, the, um, 
the infant mortality and life expectancy and the growth of population. Like the British, when they were ruling the area under the mandate, so this is through the, the late sort of the uh, late 1940s, they themselves recognized, yeah, the Arabs are pissed off with the, the newcomers for all these reasons, but look at the number of Arab factories. Look at the, the, the Arab population in 17 years grew by 50%, and it wasn't immigration. <laughs> it wasn't exclusively immigration. Yeah, so life expectancy rose mm -hmm. because the Jews bought medicine, they built hospitals, they bought standards of sanitation, Western standards of sanitation, and there was immigration into Palestine because now there were jobs, there was work. They built, I think they, they, they built the electric grid, they built you know, electric plants, they built an electric grid. In other words, they brought civilization into an area of, of, of barbarism, of, of, uh, of barbarians. And they should, they should have been, if the Arabs were pro-life, if their premise was pro, they should have celebrated the arrival of the Jews. Yeah, that, that's sort of, if you put yourself in that position, if you care about your life and you care about advancement and human progress, and if you are in that position, yeah, that would be the rational perspective to take, that you would welcome it from the perspective of, look, there's something to learn here. I can be, I can have a better life. I can learn and, and be more productive and have a better future for my children. That I think is the right perspective. But what you see a lot of the reactions and, and some of this was really drummed up by intellectuals at the time is, you know, we don't want these outsider ways. And, and an outsider is significant because it's not our group, right? Not our ethnic group, not our race, not our religion. And religion and race are sort of blended for these people in their thinking, um, these intellectuals. So it's a kind of collective xenophobia wrapped up with anti-Semitism because they, they a lot, although a lot of them were secular socialists, <laughs> <laughs> they were still oh, they were very socialist, yeah. yes. Many of them uh, communists, many of them actually emigrated from Russia because they believed that Russia wasn't moving towards communism fast enough. And that includes the founder of Israel, um, uh, uh, David Ben-Gurion, who was a member of the Communist Party for a while and, and only later became a more moderate socialist, if you will. But, but yes, they, they, but, but in spite of all that, they worked hard and, and they, they brought... A, a civilization into a law, land of barbarism. So I think that's a significant part of how would you view this if you really cared about these universe, what I think of as universal rational values of human life and progress and freedom, because there was greater freedom under Israel and it became a, a freer society than it was under the British and, and, and anything like what the Ottomans had. So all of these things, if you look at them as patterns, there are things that you would want to welcome, however unhappy you might be about the sort of uh, situation you might be in because you're a tenant or you're, you, you know, you weren't happy, you didn't, you didn't get enough compensation or you wanted to be relocated somewhere else as a result of land purchases. But this whole cluster of issues about the land was stolen. Factually, it's not accurate. And what it's covering for is a perspective on human life that's just, I don't think there's any place for it in a rational universe. Like you, if you really care about these things, you would want more places to follow that path. You, you would want there to be more development. I mean, imagine if Africa had had, had these kinds of projects a yep. hundred years ago. Like they're now trying to figure out how to get clean water in many parts of Africa. They're trying to figure out how to talk, you know, get rid of ma malaria. Israel had malaria. They had swamps and they, oh, got, they managed to get yep. rid of it. And they, clean water is not an issue. They've, they've mastered desalination. And this is in the desert, right? And they've managed to grow things in areas that were parched. So, there's a kind of development of the means for humans to, to better support human life that you have to evaluate in a positive light, if that's your standard. If the standard is human life, the Palestinians should have celebrated the arrival of these Jewish immigrants. They should have encouraged them and they should have uh, wanted to participate in them in, in, in a joint state. So why didn't that happen? Why, why, wh and why did, did they not come to be, you know, and, and Israel in which both Palestinians and Israelis, the Arabs and the Israelis, uh, you know, jointly share in, the, in, in, in civilization. So the sort of the turning point is 1947, 1948. And the, the plan that the United Nations was considering was, well, we're going to have two states, one for the Jews, one for the Arabs, and they would live in a kind of um, symbiotic, economic symbiotic relationship. That plan is really a consequence of the facts that the Arabs... Yeah. 
made it very clear to everybody they did not want to live with Jews. That is, the Arabs made it very clear that they want, because the Jews didn't care, but the Arabs made it very clear that they did not want a joint state with the Jews. Yeah, that was sort of the, the decade leading up to 1947, 1948. That's what you see. So it's an accommodation to the Arab, and there was many other accommodations on that road. Of, well, we're not going to have this one kind of Jewish state. We want our own. And, and there was a very strong direction. But what happened was that it, it wasn't essentially about land. It was, we want to own this whole area. We, we're not going to have borders that are going to limit us. And so they re, the, the, the Arab slash um, Arab states, so both the, the Arabs within Palestine and the ones outside of it, they, they, as you put it, they made it clear they weren't going to accept this. They rejected it. And what came to be when this was supposed to be put into place was a war, first within the territory. And then from outside, you get five different countries invading Israel in order to do what? It wasn't really to create an Arab state. It was to conquer it for their own sort of pathological desire for conquest. And these are regimes that are run by kings and sheikhs and people who are just you know, a few steps away from being tribal leaders, which is really what they were. So there was a, a massive war that led to Israel becoming an independent state and the, the Arab side of the conflict at the time, having rejected the opportunity to create a state, losing that war and, and, and catastrophically losing that war and ever since wanting to reverse that outcome. But what's interesting is that even in losing that war, they still held on to territories that today they want a Palestinian state in, mm -hmm. the West Bank and Gaza. What happened to those? Why, why wasn't a Palestinian state established in 1949 when the war was over? Yeah, so, so those, for people who know a little bit about, about the geography, so the West Bank is sort of a territory that became part of what is now Jordan, and the Gaza Strip fell kind of under Egyptian rule. And through 1967, basically, those were governed by those two states, those, what would be Palestinian territory. And there was no interest in, I mean, this goes to a deeper issue about what is the Palestinian movement and when the Palestinians show up on the scene. So they weren't really a factor in 47, 48. There really wasn't uh, salient. They, they come on the scene in the 1960s. And a big part of it is a, a push by some of the Arab dictators, notably um, uh, uh, Nasser, Gamal Abdel Nasser, who, who felt like, well, we've tried a whole bunch of times to destroy this country. And he really thought in terms of liquidating Israel. That was some of his perspective on it. They couldn't really do it through conventional means. So he thought, well, let's get these Palestinian guerrillas organized. Let's make them the front of this conflict. And what were they, what were they doing in those territories that were under uh, uh, Egyptian and Jordanian rule that they would want today to make Palestine. Well, the Palestinian people who lived there became subjects to these tyrannical regimes who then, uh, Egypt in particular, let the Palestinian movement kind of set up bases in the Gaza Strip through the late 60s and use it as a launching pad for further sort of guerrilla and terrorist attacks on Israel. So these weren't, there was no desire and every, in fact, attempts to create self-governing um, communities that were squashed by the ruling uh, countries, Jordan and Egypt. So there's really no, con no real concern on, it wasn't a, any talk of Palestinian independence was, wasn't really salient back then. And to the extent people were doing it, it was, well, that's not what we want, meaning we the dictators of the region. That's not at all the goal. Um, what happens after 1967, so now we're kind of walking through the history. Now, after 1967, those territories, so the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, they are, Israel wins another war uh, against its enemies led by Egypt in a preemptive strike on Egyptian and Syrian forces. Uh, and those territories fall under Israeli control. Um, and subsequent to that, Israel is said to occupy them and, and one thing I talk about in the book, we, I go into depth about what is this occupation because it's a big source of grievance and, and, and attacks on Israel. Those same territories that were under Egypt and Jordanian rule, after the 67, they actually stopped flourishing economically in a way that they never had before. And so the, whatever else you might say about the Israeli policy in those areas, and it had its problems, People were, they, they got the benefits of a, a more prosperous society. They got economic integration with Israel and it lifted them economically in, in significant ways. Yeah, I, mean, I have firsthand experience with that. I mean, I, I was in the construction industry. I was a, a, a construction manager, civil engineer 
in the 1980s. And all my workers were Palestinians who came in from the West Bank or Gaza, a million Palestinians from those territories. I'm not talking about Israeli Arabs. I'm talking about Palestinians who define themselves as Palestinians, I guess, coming into Israel, sleeping a million of them. They were, the, the entire construction business, all the restaurants, all the, all the, the manual labor in Israel was basically done by Palestinians. Uh, they, when you talk to them, their main concern was making enough money to feed their family, uh, to, to, to see their kids grow up. Uh, they, they wanted their kids to get an education. I mean, they were before what I would call the radicalization of the Palestinians in the late 18, uh, 1980s and certainly in the 1990s, they were primarily concerned with their economic well-being and they, the opportunities they got by living under Israeli rule were unbelievable to them. And it was, their standard of living was improving dramatically uh, in every aspect, you know, the numbers are there. It's only after, you know, what I think happened in the late 80s and, and certainly after Oslo that they really get radicalized and they become much more anti-Israel. And even today, there's some polls that show that, mo that a significant number of Palestinians, potentially a, a, a majority, would like, would like actually to be under Israeli rule, not under the Palestinian Authority. Yeah, and you definitely, there's definitely data to support that view that th there are people, and even before some of the worst aspects of the Palestinian Authority and its tyr tyrannical rule, even before that was even a reality, there were, there were people within Israel saying, yeah, even once there's a Palestinian state, I don't want to go there. I, I want to stay here. And yeah. that tells you something. And that's, I think, um, but your point about what you call a radicalization, I think that's a really important theme to, to touch on because it's a, it was actually a, um, you can see it as a definite goal of the Palestinian movement to create a society or a culture that is deeply committed to this goal, as I argue in the book, a goal of destroying a free society and then creating what they think of as, um, you know, Palestine under Palestinian rule, which is really another kind of, an, yet another dictatorship in the Middle East. And so they, you know, it's in their, their charter, it's in their, 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 their founding documents to create in the same way the Soviets wanted to create a Soviet man, they wanted to, in, to kind of push down and impose this, this ideology of, of uh, control and, and racial identity and destruction of the enemy. And what they've done over generations, so if you think of it as starting in earnest in the sort of late 60s, going through the 70s and the 80s, and what you see in the 80s and 90s is the, the ideology was initially kind of a nationalist, ethnic, Arab perspective and with a particular Palestinian slant. We want to stay for the Palestinian nation. But that gets overtaken by the, the, the trends in the region. The major trend in the region post-79 is the Islamist movement. And so these, these two tracks, so there's kind of the nationalist Palestinian cause. And then, you know, after this, in the 80s and 90s and through the 2000s, it becomes a, the, the leading forces within that become Islamist. And it's no longer, oh, we are an Arab peoples, we need our own Arab state. It's, it's, no, we're not. We're, we are a part of the world Muslim community. We have to dominate. And, you know, F these Jews, they have no, no place on Muslim land. And we're going to fight a jihad. And that is literally what is in the Hamas charter. That is what is the Palestinian Islamic jihad both of which incidentally are spinning off from the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine, which has been there for decades. So the, the, the conflict is, I mean, as we said from the beginning, it, it's seen as it's about pieces, one piece of land and two groups of people, but it's fundamentally an ideological conflict. It's, it's the ideas that are moving both sides. So one society wants to live in freedom and prosper to the extent that it can. And another group of people have, are driven by these pathologies of, of domination and conquest. And then it's given ideological respectability through nationalism. And now in sort of the last two decades, particularly an Islamist identity and mission, right? And because they really are morally committed to this mission, which Israelis are not. I mean, Israelis are kind of exhausted and, and in many ways, they don't have the energy to do this. And have been for a long time. Yeah. Well, I, I, it used to be, a, I mean, there's still, is, there's a song famous song in Israel, I think it was in the, probably the late eighties. And it goes, it goes, I'm not going to sing it, but it goes something <laughs> like, you know, we're tired. Uh, uh, um, how does it go? It, it, it's, it's like, um, 
you know, we've got all these problems and, you know, we'll keep going and we're not tired of this. We're not tired of the one thing we really are tired of and we can't do any more are wars. Uh, uh, you know, the, the one thing that we, we just can't handle anymore is wars. And uh, it's true. Israeli society has always been since, since I was a kid fatigued by the bloodshed, fatigued by the war. And that's why they've been willing to go out of their way, out of their way in spite of the propaganda out there to try to cut a deal with anybody, right? And I think with them, it really is the fatigue. I don't think it's as much the moral relativism and all of that. I really think it's just, it's a tiny country. Everybody knows, or at least used to know people who died in wars. The wars killed large percentages of the population because it's such a small country. And, and it's just that, that immense fatigue that comes from your kids are going to the army. You don't know if they're going to come back alive. And, and you just want to cut a deal. Just, just something. Make it go away. And I think, I think it's really hood Israel, that attitude, because I think they've cut some bad deals, uh, very bad deals over the years. So let's, let's switch a little bit. Let, let me ask you this. Why do you think um, – so let me just say something because I'm seeing it on the chat. Let me just say something about generalization. So when Ilan or I say the Arabs this, the Muslims this, it does not imply that every Arab or every Muslim. It implies that the dominant trend within those cultures, particularly when we talk about Islamists, the dominant trend among Islamists, the dominant in, in Arabs, the dominant trends in Arab culture. Of course, not every Arab wants every Jew dead. Of course, not every uh, person who takes Islam seriously and here I, I'll, get, I'll get a backlash. Even every person who takes Islam seriously does not want to conquer and establish Sharia over the entire world. Uh, but you have to, you have to generalize. You, ha you have to talk in abstractions. And so it's, it's, the, it's what is the dominant trend within these movements or what is the dominant trend within the culture? Within, within, uh, w w I don't know if you want to add something. Yeah. So I, I haven't seen the questions, but I, I want to touch on this because I talk about it in the book in detail. Because one of the things I, I hope people will get, and I think your audience here on living objectivism might have a particular interest in it, is there are many ways in which the way we think about this conflict is colored by collectivism. Yes. And so we've used the term Arab a lot. And we've even used the term Palestinian, both of which are inherently non-objective in the sense that, and even Jew has its own problems. Like, how do you actually define it? And I talk about that. But let's take Arab. What does it really mean to be an Arab? Because my grandparents from Iraq are Arabs and they were devout Jews. Yeah. There are Arabs who are Christians. There are Arabs who are Muslims <laughs> and there are Arabs who are none of the above because they're atheists. And I know some of them. <laughs> yep. So Arab is not an objectivist. That's right. And you can get Arabs who are communists. And many of the Palestinian leaders were communists. Yes. So and Nasser was a nationalist and a religious leader. Um, so these concepts are not helpful. And what I talk about in the book are positions and views and whoever subscribes to them. And I don't, it, it's very tricky to try to talk about Arabs or Palestinians. Now, Palestinian is a, is a sort of sub issue under Arab. And again, there are many problems in how you define it. So I, I agree with your characterization. What we're talking about are arguments and positions and whoever is a follower of that view, whoever articulates it and supports it, what, it's not a way of, it, it, we're not dealing in collectives, even if the people who are making these arguments, and especially Palestinians, want themselves, view themselves as members of a collective, or want others to view them as a collective, which is definitely part of the Palestinian movement's agenda. It's like, we have a collective, part of it was hurt 70 years ago, and we're still hurting because we're an organic being. Like You can't think in those terms, you can't evaluate, and it's no way to reach moral judgments to talk about collectives. What you need to talk about are individual human beings, and then what are the ideas and trends in those cultures and societies? And I agree with you. I mean, one of the things people don't realize is that in Israel, there are Arabs who are Muslims who serve in the government, right? And so it's clear, we're not talking about this as if it's you're born an Arab, therefore you have these views. It's not that kind of, that's wrong. That's not at all the way to understand these issues. Um, and there are atheists who work in Israel, and there, there are all kinds of people. What we're talking about are movements and ideologies and the people who follow them and, le and lead them and act on those goals, and anyone who endorses them and supports them, and there's gradations among this. So there's definitely Palestinians who would never become suicide bombers. 
And but they don't. They also don't want to live under Arafat. They don't want to live under Hamas. But they still hate the Jews. But yep. what do you say about that? Because they have a view of the Jews as a collective, which again is a wrong perspective. Because you know, my grandparents. You know horrible don't, Jews. I know. I, mean, I don't. I, I, they, we can go for hours on how it's so corrupting of thought to talk about collectives. And part of what I talk, and, and I want to get to this from a different perspective, which is: Is my book pro-Israel? No, this is not at all a helpful way to think about it. Yep. My book is not pro a country as a whole, including all the irrational people in it and all the rational people in it. Because again, you can't talk in broad terms like that. In the same way that your book on finance isn't pro business, it's pro productive achievement and anyone who lives up to that. And my view is I'm pro freedom and anyone, wherever he is, whatever uh, background who stands for that and wants to realize it in Israel, outside Israel and throughout the region. It, it just so happens, and it's important that in Israel, there are a lot of people who value freedom and a society built on that premise. And that's a significant part of what one has to view in this conflict. Yep. And, and the region, and the sort of the flip side of that is in the region, what you have isn't just indifference to freedom, but outright hostility to it from people who are secular, nationalist, ethnic, religious, various sects. I mean, that is one of the defining themes in the region, part of why it's in such a bad state. It's hostile to human life and hostile to freedom and that doesn't mean every last person there is that because we know there are good people in egypt in all sorts of countries and i met them there's just the dominant views and the people who agree with them it it's it's unbelievably striking how how difficult it is for people to think in terms of individualistic terms i mean i'm seeing it on the chat here everybody's talking about their land, the Arab land, the Jews land, the Jews did this, the Arabs did this. It's not the way to think about the conflict at all. You have to think in terms of individuals, individuals who moved from Europe to what was then called Palestine under the Ottoman Empire, bought land and established a free country for individuals. That's what matters. It, it, whether they were Jews or not, is irrelevant to this. I mean, it's relevant to other discussions, but it's irrelevant to this discussion. And whether the land was owned by Arabs before, Philistines or Romans or Ottomans or fill in the blank is irrelevant. Their label, their group affiliation does not matter. That is that is collectivistic thinking that is so entrenched in, in our lives. Let me just uh, give the book a plug. Um, those of you who've joined the conversation, we're talking to Ilan Juno. We're talking about his new book. Here it is on on screen, I think, not yet, there it is, on screen. It's on Amazon, you can see, you can pre-order it. For those of you wondering, why is there no Kindle version? The Kindle version is coming. Uh, it, it'll, be, it'll be loaded up uh, sometime before the book is published, uh, uh, is available uh, in June. Uh, the, the book is What Justice Demands, America and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflicts. It's very much taking an American perspective and, and the, the approach of what America's view or what Americans' view should be of this conflict. I encourage you all to pre-order it. You can pre-order it now. It'll be really helpful, and, and I really appreciate that. It's got fantastic reviews. I mean, if you look at the list, uh, you probably can't see it on the screen, but if you look at, at the list of who has written blurbs for the book, this is the who's who list of um, Middle East commentators from the rational perspective, from, you know, as I see it, uh, people like Angelo Cordovilla and uh, Yoram Hazoni uh, in Israel. Angelo Cordovilla is a Catholic here in the United States. Uh, Efren Koresh, again, in Israel, Daniel Pipes. Uh, but really, the who's who list, I think, of a uh, rational commentator in the Middle East, people I've admired uh, certainly since 9-11 and who've done good work. Not everybody agrees with everything Ilan and I stand for, not everybody, not everything they do, we agree with, but, uh, but these, are, these are some of the best people. So I encourage you to buy the book, go pre-order it, um, it's, um, and, uh, and, and share it with your friends, share the show with your friends, and hopefully we can get the book up on the, uh, on the bestseller uh, list. All right, let's, let's kind of move, tilt a little bit, and, and what I wanna ask, I think we've answered this question somewhat already, but, and the question is, why do people hate Israel so much? Why is there so many people who are poor Palestinians? Think about Europe today. Think about, um, I mean, Europe is dominantly anti-Israel. I mean, I, I, I go to, I, I speak at the UK all the time. And the dominant people who, who, who are trying to obstruct my speeches and stop me, even though I'm not speaking about Israel, 
are pro-Palestinian groups. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., I think that the number of people who are anti, particularly among the young anti-Israel, is growing. The, 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 this uh, boycott Israel movement is growing. And then there's the whole libertarian anti-Israel phenomena, which is just mind-boggling to me. It, it, you know, not really, if you understand what libertarianism is, but it goes against kind of their idea that they are pro-individualism, which at the end of the day, they're not. So it, what, what, what is your perspective on, on, the, on why people are so anti-Israel and pro-Palestinian? I think it goes to a moral premise that's prevalent in the culture. And I think it connects with both of those communities, both the sort of idealistic students. And if you want to put another category, the sort of the, the libertarians that you're referring to, if you think of them as libertarians, and it's not clear what that really means. Yeah, exactly. but so if you take students and I've been on college campuses and I met a lot of these students and um, part of what happens is this, so the moral premise in our culture is that there's a kind of, um, sort of, you know, your attention, the premise is altruism, as, I, as Ayn Rand describes it. And I think it takes many forms. One of those forms is it, it programs people's thinking to be oriented to who's the sufferer, who's the underdog, who's down. And that matters. That's where your attention should go. And if someone is strong or productive or whatever virtues they actually have, real virtues we're talking about, then that's already suspicious, maybe even necessarily a problem. And you see this both in economic terms and you see it in foreign policy. And, and what happens is that if that's the sort of framing you bring to this issue, a lot of times you don't even look at the, the history. What you know is, wow, I feel really bad for the people suffering in Gaza. And look how poor they are. And Israel is so much stronger militarily and it's punching down and we're helping them. And the Palestinians have this whole history of, and, and some of it is definitely something they, they accentuate and it's a big part of their propaganda. Is we're the victims here and we deserve your sympathy. And so if you're an idealistic person, the ideals that animate you often are, well, I, I believe in doing right and I believe in the good. And that means concern with the suffering. And well, then sort of there's a default position that it's got to be that the Palestinians have got something on their side. And the Israelis, well, they're stronger, so we've got to be suspicious. And then if you fill that in with some of the arguments you hear from the sort of pro-Palestinian side of the, the Palestinian movement's argument, then it kind of reinforces that moral, what I think of as a prejudice, really. It's a prejudice against the productive and the able in favor of the needy and the suffering. And my, part of what I argue in the book is that that's a corruption of the concept of justice. Like justice tells you not find the weakest person and be sympathetic to them because you can find lots of weak, small groups that are evil. Like the, you know, if you think of the jihadists, there are way fewer jihadists in the world than there are if you count every soldier in the U S army, that doesn't mean you're sympathetic to the jihadists or, you know, the, and then there are actually victims who are the underdog in a certain sense who are innocent victims. So th there's no necessary connection between being weak and small and suffering and actually having justice on your side. They don't go together necessarily. So what you have to do is actually judge um, and separate that out. And so what, what I think helps, what causes a lot of students and people on campus to be swept up in this is one part idealism informed by this kind of altruistic perspective that they've got to have. And, and you know, the news coming out of this conflict is, is colored by this too. Like, look at all the people in Gaza who don't have water and like, oh, their houses are bombed out. Okay, but, but well, why are their houses bombed out? What is the conflict really about? What do they believe needs to happen to their opponents? And, and talk about doing? altruism, just because you mentioned water. Israel is supplying them with the water. <laughs> Whatever water they have in Gaza is being supplied by Israel, who has developed technology to, to desalinate the ocean. There's no water supply in Gaza other than what they get from Israel, which is an act of ultimate altruism because they, they're giving water to people dedicated to killing them. Yeah, and, and electricity flows and they control that. And there's all kinds of ways in which that is playing out. And if you want to talk about the other side of this, so another, is this, let's, let's make sure everyone understands, th these two camps don't exhaust the sources of hostility to Israel, but they're significant for this audience because, I mean, and I think there's something good about what draws students to this perspective because it's the right premise to be on. Like you want to be on the side of the right. Yep. But how they think about what right and wrong and how to judge is that's a problem. That's what the book's trying to fix. Now, if you talk about the libertarian side, now I think of that as a very fuzzy term 
And I think there are at least two issues going on and they're both ultimately philosophical issues. One is there's definitely people who are on that kind of think of themselves as a libertarian whose moral perspective just is an altruistic perspective. They don't come at it. They don't come at their political philosophy from, I believe in rational egoism and I, I'm an individualist to the core. Therefore, I think we need capitalism, which is Ayn Rand's perspective. Like her, for her, capitalism is the consequence of having a rational ethics yep. that's individualist. And so their view is, well, libertarianism best solves for serving the needy in society. Or, or their view is that, well, we need some sort of accommodation for the, the poor and the suffering because that's their moral outlook, whether they recognize it or not. And that th predisposes them to think, well, you know, there's a whole bunch of poor people and they're suffering and then we've got to have some concern with that. And then the other thing that goes on for many people who identify as libertarian is there's a kind of, not, this is certainly not true of all of them because they're really good people that I, I respect and we think of themselves as libertarian, but there's this view of government as a, an, an evil. Yep. <laughs> and my view- In of itself, is, no matter yeah. what its character is, yes. Right, and, and my view is government's a necessary good and it, that's why it's so important that you have a right kind of government. And so you look at the Middle East and you think, well, look how controlling Israel, look how strong it is. And, and, and we don't like that. That's a bad thing. It's a government that's successful. We don't want any part of that. Yeah. And it's this view that government is inherently a problem. And, and there's other reasons they like, but to me, it's, it, it's not having a view of morality driving your political views. I think um, that's right. Now, there's an, it, interesting think, piece, yeah. sorry, there's an interesting piece I read a while ago from, I forget, it's maybe the 60s or 70s by, um, the famous anarchist libertarian, I think, Murray Rothbard, I think maybe that. So he has a piece where he, he talks about Israel and the Palestinians. And one of the things he really ha kind of emphasizes is that it's, um, I mean, there's definitely sympathy to the Palestinians in that argument article. And it's surprising because the whole setup for the article, I forget the title, is we need, we need deeper thinking on this issue. And the whole thing is incredibly superficial. It's like, these are freedom fighters. And Israel is just this is a kind of re religious tyranny. And it, even at the time, that wasn't true. So yeah. there's just willful, um, unthinking approaches to this that I think are part of the problem. So, yeah, no, I definitely think I think it, I think the libertarian subjectivism there is again, some libertarians, their, their altruism, they haven't abandoned altruism. They 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 consistently. So somebody here is complaining about Israel bombing children or bombing, uh, you know, bombing houses and so on. I mean, really, you're trying to defend yourself and therefore you're not going to you're not going to bulldoze. You're not going to bomb. You're not going to kill the people who are trying to kill you. you. You just stand there waiting. So there's a pacifist element. Mm -hmm. But I think all of it, uh, it what underlies much of these uh, anarchist perspective is really hatred, hatred of the good. It, it's a certain they hate America. I mean, Rothbard, it comes out of this Rothbardian view that there's nothing worse than the American government. The American government is the worst. Stalin is better than America. And um, yeah, and if Stalin is better than America, then Palestinians are better than Israel. It, so it's, it's hatred of any government that is somewhat successful, right? Even a little bit because they're successful. So there really is envy and, and nihilism and all driven by kind of a, a horrible, horrible moral subjectivism. And then I would add, particularly in Europe, but I think also more and more here that there's, there's definitely anti-Semitism, yeah. definitely an anti-Jewish aspect to all of this because they don't listen to facts. They, you know, they, when, when um, anybody else can defend themselves, right, uh, 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 France can go to North Africa right. and bomb in Mali and, and bomb terror, you know, the, the Islamists and kill women and children and nobody cares. The French certainly don't care. But... Jews defending themselves, that is completely unacceptable. That we cannot tolerate. You know, if, 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 if Mexico was bombarding uh, a city on, on, you know, San Diego, would anybody be overly concerned, Americans, about where the bombs were hitting in Mexico? The, the whole premise that they live under is uh, there's, a, there's a different attitude towards Israel because they're Jews. Not everybody, but but from some people, it, it, there's absolutely no question, uh, no question that they do this. So some people, why did France bomb Mali? Because Mali is a haven of Islamists, and the Islamists were attacking France, and France 
went to Tenoch. Mali's a former French colony, I think. And, uh, and they went in there and, to help the government defeat the Islamists. And France has been involved in Northern Africa for a long, long time, justifiably or unjustifiably. My point is, all over the world, people are killing each other. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. But, but Israel kills anybody. And it makes the headlines in every major newspaper in the world. Yeah, I mean, one interesting data point that people can look up is around the time of the first Gaza war, I think it was 80, 2008, 2009, which, and that led to a whole UN inquiry about war crimes and so forth. Around that time, Sri Lanka was winding down. It's, there's an insurgency in Sri Lanka. And the way they, they ended this insurgency was through what's called total war. They just killed tens of thousands of people. And it was like a crazy amount of, 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 uh, of death. And I forget exactly the timing of this, but it was around this time that Israel was being, you know, pulled over the rakes for its conduct in Gaza. And, and I write about this in the book too. But how much did you hear about what happened in Sri Lanka, which proportionally in terms of human lives and the cost and the, and the amount of time it took and in, in the, the, even the conduct you might criticize? You, I don't think you heard nearly the same amount about Sri Lanka as you did in terms of what Israel did, uh, which was, you know, in, in numerical terms, much smaller. And the wider point is that this issue of the anti-Semitism that you're referring to, which I think one of the greatest manifestations of it, which really reflects a global perspective, is what happens at the UN. So there is, in the, I don't know, 10 or so year, however long it's been that there's been a United Nations Human Rights Commission. There used to be a different body, but ever since they reformed it, and, and it's as a rule, they have singled out Israel more than they have singled out any other country, including countries where we see people being killed in the streets, like Iran, and we've seen it in um, in Venezuela and and in all ki- all parts of the world. Those countries aren't given the same kind of treatment, and part of it is there's dynamics within the UN, which is is heavily dominated by these dictatorial regimes and, and sympathetic regimes to them. But there is definitely a kind of um, you know, you, sometimes it's put in terms of double standards, but I think it's 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 worse than a double standard because it's 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 giving a special negative focus to one country because it isn't like they, they hold it to a higher standard. Those there though there's arguments about whether you would hold it to a higher standard, but it isn't even that. It's just well, who are they to do this kind of thing in the first place? Um, and you know, it is. Um, Anti-Semitism is not a topic I get into much in the book, but you and I have talked about it and you've given talks on the subject. And one of the things that people, I think, really need to appreciate is this is a long-standing phenomenon and it isn't really about religion <laughs> in the sense that it's, you can, there, there were cases in Europe and so part of what led to the growth of Zionism, the idea that Jews have to have a country, is that there were secular, assimilated Jews in Europe meaning they were indistinguishable culturally and intellectually from the people that they grew up with in Germany or France or, or, Vienna or Austria. And independent of all that, they were still pointed to in the street and called a Jew. Why? Because there's a kind of tribal collective and a racial component to it that you could never, that you could never get out of it. And this is part of why, and you look at the way the Nazis defined Jew, it, was, it had to do with heredity, independent of whether you go to synagogue or not. And I'm actually a fairly militant atheist, in my view, <laughs> as, as, as atheists go. And I, I, when I was growing up, I was true, too. And people still pointed to me, and I got all kinds of anti-Jewish uh, yeah. criticism and things like that. So there's a phenomenon that d- deserves real attention, and it isn't, and it's separable from what Israel does. But it's now compounded by the fact that there's a whole country that people can point to and use as a whipping boy for this issue. All right, so let's move on. Let's move on to um, America's role here in what may be the positive case. We've talked about how America's compromised Israel and and weakened it. But but so maybe talk a little bit about that. But then, what do you think America's stance should be vis-a-vis Israel, and why? I think the the defining theme of American policy, if you look at, and I look at primarily the last 25 years, which is when America became deeply involved in attempts to resolve a conflict. And the defining theme there is a negation of justice. Like we're going to do policy and we're going to try to resolve this and negotiate a solution. And yeah, there there are hard questions in this conflict. They're moral questions. We're not going to deal with those. We're going to put them to the sides because what we want is we want outcomes. We want 
compromise and we want middle of the road solutions. And if we get boiled, bogged up in these moral questions, we're never going to get there. And to me, that is, and that's true of Clinton. Uh, that's true of Bush in a certain important way. And it was definitely true of Obama. And there's elements of it coming through, I think, under Trump, who's got a peace, pro peace plan reboot in the works. And that approach, which I call, I mean, in various ways, it is, we're going to put more moral questions to the side. We're going to negate any kind of importance to moral questions. And my view is that kind of agnosticism to this is a recipe for disaster. And so that's part of what informs George Bush's sellout of Israel in, in, during his administration, which we talked about early in the conversation. And, and the, one of the results of that is you empower the people who are hostile to you. You make them stronger and you give them moral credibility and encouragement. And, and that's, that's sort of the defining theme is that when you, when you take morality out of this issue, you, you try to address it without first coming to objective judgments about the adversaries and what you should do, is you can't solve it and you can only make it worse, which is sort of the, the record of the last uh, few decades. And what I argue in the book is, well, that is the lesson. Is you, you, it's not an option. It's not a nice to have. It's a must do that you bring morality into it and specifically moral judgment of the adversaries and also of America's stake in it. And so the book sets up, well, here's how to, here's how to do that to reach a view of where, you're, where you should stand if you care about these fundamental values of human life and freedom and progress and prosperity. So, I, you know, the book comes out and says, well, it's to the extent that Israel is a free society, that is the side you should stand on. And, and anyone else who's for freedom in that region, you, they deserve your support, not the tyrants, the monarchs and the theocrats, which is essentially what we've been doing. Um, and so I, I have a, a chapter arguing, what does it mean to be, to have a principled approach to this region that takes freedom and individualism as the moral compass? And I come out with, well, you need to be pro-Israel for these particular reasons, that it's a free society, and to the extent that it is. And if it stops being a free society, you wouldn't have this view. Like, it's, it's a conditional evaluation. And, and consequently, you, you would have to be hostile to anyone who's anti-freedom. And that's primarily the, the Palestinian cause. And then all the regimes that support it and enabled it. And then all the regimes in the region that are themselves variations on the theme of, of tyranny and authoritarianism. And you would have to use that principle of freedom as, an, as a guide to, well, who are our friends and who are our allies? You, you would have to stop pretending, for example, that Saudi Arabia is a bosom ally. It is not. I mean, that's, that is a, one of the longstanding um, scandals of American foreign policy. And the same thing with Iran. It's not like, well, yeah, all we need is a better Iran nuclear deal that you know, the Trump team can renegotiate and get us better. That, that is ridiculous. What you need is to really appreciate that Iran is, the, is one of the spearheads of the Islamist movement and you can't deal with them. Like they're, they need to be eliminated. So that's sort of the, the, the basic framework of how to evaluate and, and figure out our stake in the Middle East. And then I have more concrete uh, kind of steps towards, well, how do you end this conflict and how do you end, kind of clear the road so that there can be a f sort of long-term resolution. But the, the, cre the key thing in that part of the book is, it's, it's worse than foolish to think there's some overnight solution. Yep. You need to take certain steps that create the possibility of a solution, but then it's the Palestinians have to change their moral values and their cultural values. And that could take generations. Yeah, yeah. And I talk about some of what that involves, and th there's things they can do and there's values they can adopt, but it, they and all the other people in the region who are, who are hostile to freedom and progress, and there's too many of them, they all need to change their views. And, and unless that happens, you're fooling yourself into thinking that there's some like, oh yeah, if we add that eighth piece of paper in the agreement, we could then have peace tomorrow. That is ridiculous. And that, yep. But that's essentially how they think of this. And it won't happen unless the U.S. leads on that. That is, the U.S. has to demand that that happen. The U.S. has to support Israel's efforts in making that happen because it won't happen otherwise. As long as the U.S. is ambiguous morally, that sanctions the Palestinians to take on whatever whatever uh, uh, position they want, it, and, and it's it's uh, it it really is uh, an you know the U.S. is 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 a moral leader whether it likes it or not. I mean, the, the only other alternative is the U.S. to butt out completely, 
and let Israel do whatever it needs to do. But as long as Israel, the United States is in a leadership position, its ambiguity helps the Palestinians. It's yeah, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by butt out, but I would take that to mean that would have to be only you would butt out and say, we're doing this. We're giving you the room to do the right thing, not we're doing this and we don't care because butting out can also mean the kind of Ron Paul perspective. Like if we only leave them alone, they would leave us alone, which is, this is not at all true. Um, I mean that I think your point about moral leadership is it, it is essential that, I mean, what we do sends so many signals in the region that people don't appreciate that it, like, every little step we take is a signal to our adversaries and our friends about how serious we are. And we are a giant as a as sort of America is a giant on the world stage, even if it behaves like a kind of a wimp in many ways, in my view. And that kind of, to me, the, the most, this goes to an issue that I think some of your listeners might be really exercised about, which is America's view of its support of Israel is typically seen as essentially material. Like, look at all the military hardware we can give you and look at all the, the collaborations we can do and the technology and the money and the, the, mil, the financial backing. Yeah, okay, you might have arguments about doing that. And I'm not against technological and, and, and military collaboration and even selling them arms. But it's completely wrong to think that being pro-Israel and kind of pro-free societies means we just the pile on the money. That's not what it means. It's primarily a moral endorsement. And that's sort of your point about America having to, to take this as a really firm stand. And I don't think America has a choice about being a moral leader. It should, it should be something we, we, we shoulder and really live, live up to uh, because nobody else can do it and nobody no, else has a claim to it. And given that we have the mightiest military force on the planet, we have to be because there has to be some guidance to that military force. Government is force. And, and the government has to be guided by proper morality. And it's not. Now, let me just, I know there's a lot of discussion going on about killing civilians and all this. All of that is addressed in uh, Ilan's other book. And I want you to refer to that because I'm not, we don't yeah. have time to talk about all that here. But here's the other book. I'm putting it up on screen. Uh, this is the book, Winning the Unwinnable War. There's a series of essays there on issues related. Ilan's opening essay in the book it deals with the issue issues of uh, civilian casualties and what's appropriate to do in wartime. Uh, there's, a, there's an essay there about just war theory that, that I co-authored with Alex Epstein about, about uh, civilian casualties in war. And the, you know, so... If you're really interested in the whole question of uh, morality, war, the Middle East, the Islamists, I highly recommend both these books. So, uh, so the, 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 the first book, Winning an Unwinnable War, and then, of course, Ilan's new book, uh, which is, uh, I think I've got it on screen. There we go. Uh, which is on screen now, which is What Justice Demands, which is specifically oriented towards the question of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And uh, let me just, let me, I'm just going to say something, and, and uh, I know I'm often accused of insulting my audience, but let me just say something just based on the chat and stuff. A lot of people are just ignorant about this crisis. A lot of people who think they know are ignorant about this crisis. A lot of people just don't know the facts and don't know the evidence. They, a lot of people also have the wrong moral perspective on it, but they don't know the actual history, they don't actually know Israel. I bet you that most of the people who are criticizing Israel have never even been there. Although there are plenty of Israelis who criticize Israel inappropriately. It, I, 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 the altruism trumps anything. Um, I, I recommend reading Elon's book to, to learn more about the facts, right? So somebody's accusing me of ad hominem. It's not ad hominem. I'm just saying you're probably ignorant. Read the book, learn more. Uh, if you're not ignorant, great, good for you. Um, then you're just wrong philosophically, morally, uh, and, and from any other perspective, given given what you've been spouting on the chat. Um, so uh, go engage with the book, read it. Uh, for those of you, for everybody, like it or hate it or middle of the road, write, write on Amazon, write reviews on Amazon. Uh, really would appreciate that. But read it first. I've noticed that some people are writing reviews on Amazon before they read the book, or <laughs> both positive and negative. So please read it first. But um, 
Let me let me say wants? something about that, you're on, because I I think I haven't seen the chat, so I don't know kind of questions. But there there are going to be questions about the book, and I anticipate that a lot of people, even if they're sympathetic to Ayn Rand or even object, they're going to disagree with things, and that's sure. that's sure. okay. And I want what I'm going to do after the book comes out, and people have a chance to read it, because I think it's a necessary condition that you read the book to have a view of it, and a view of the argument specifically, so not to make light of your views. But I expect there'll be questions and disagreements and hard issues. And, and I'm not, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to have some online uh, Q and A's with people. So send questions and I'll be answering questions and I'm going to do this uh, at live events. I'm going to do this online. And I want those questions because I think part of what happens is uh, and I understand your frustration and it could be well warranted with some of the people you're referring to. I don't know well, what some they're saying. people believe me is warranted. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot to learn about this yeah. conflict. It's a complex yeah. conflict. There are a lot of issues yeah. and there's a lot to learn about the unique perspective objectivism yeah. has on, on morality yeah. and applying morality to political, to political international context. None of this is simple. And that's why I encourage people to, you know, to, to read the books and, uh, and, and to, to engage with the actual content uh, rather than throwing out, uh, throwing out comments or, or committing yourself to a perspective without being challenged with the opposite. Because I don't think you'll get Elon's perspective on this crisis, the objectivist perspective on this crisis from anybody else. Let me say one thing about that, because I know the theme of the show is living objectivism. Yeah. And part of my goal in the book is to, it, it's a sub it's not something I talk about explicitly, but it's part of the, what drove me to write the book. And it's to say, look, objectivism is an incredibly powerful philosophy. And it is a philosophy for living on earth in, the, in, in, in many ways, in your own life, in your own pursuit of happiness, but also, and, and in this case, especially for understanding the world. And talk about a, a quintessentially impossible conflict, right? This is one of the hardest cases you could take on. And the goal of taking it on is to say, you know, objectivism has so much value to contribute to our thinking and our understanding of the world and to solving really hard problems. And the way to do that is not to, to it's not a, a policy perspective or policy analysis. It's, it's a, a, a philosophic reassessment and analysis of an issue. And so what, part of what I mean, I want to encourage people and, you know, both the, the ones who are sincere and the ones who might not be so sincere is, is to really grapple with that part of what the book is saying is here's a, a new philosophic perspective on this issue, which I think is incredibly clarifying. You are going to have questions. Let's talk about them. I want people to ask questions. I think it'll help me. I'm interested in learning what people's views are and the objections they have. But I think th to me, the value is you will get an, a greater appreciation for what it means to hold a kind of pro-individualist, pro-capitalist, uh, pro-reason perspective on the world by engaging with the book. Because if you, I think part of what I try, and I think I accomplished this, is to present that perspective on this issue. And I know it's charged, but then every issue is charged. And, you, and that's fine. You need to, people, part of what I want is for people to get, okay, you could be really upset with me, but let's talk about the issue. I mean, let's not, <laughs> let's not fight about the- Well, it seems like, it, it, for the reasons I think we've talked about, it seems like this issue seems to be more charged than a lot of other uh, issues. And um, for a variety of reasons, uh -huh. but 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 yes, people get very emotional about it, uh, as as with others. But yes, uh, uh, how can people contact you, or how can people challenge you? Uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter. Yeah, all of the above. So I'm on Facebook, uh, Elon Journo. You can search me there. On I don't think there are any others with that name. I'm on Twitter at Elon Journo. I have a website, elonjourno.com, and you can find my email. You can reach me at the Institute. And um, for any of those channels, if you send me questions, I, I, I'm going to save them up for doing some of these online sessions. I'm not going to, I can't commit to answering individually, but I'm going to do kind of um, summary Q&A sessions here and there. Um, and I, I, part of my goal is that I want to engage with people um, who are interested in Ayn Rand in particular and also in the libertarian movement, the, the, however they think of themselves. Because um, I think this is one issue where um, it, it's the difficulty of understanding it is important. And, and it's, it's a case study of how having a rational perspective is so valuable. And I want people to gain the benefit of kind of grappling with that and challenge their own thinking. Because um, they might find that they have some premises they need to check. Um, and I think uh, some of the people I've met and who've challenged me, that's often part of what motivates them. Yes. 
Yes, good. Um, well, again, everybody, here's the, you know, here's the book. Um, don't, uh, you can pre-order it now. I hope you do. I, I think you'll learn a lot from it, whether you agree or disagree at the end of the day. If you uh, agree or disagree, um, follow uh, Ilan on Facebook, on Twitter, and go to his website, ilanjournal.com. Uh, I also recommend you read his other book, uh, Winning the Unwinnable War. Uh, and uh, I think if you read those two books, you'll get a sense of how, how we, at least at the Anwen Institute, apply objectivism to questions of conflict and to questions of foreign policy. It, it, and it's not obvious, and it's, people are going to disagree. And even within the broader, I'd say, objectivist movement, there are people who, who disagree on some of these issues. But um, I encourage you all to, to engage. Uh, go read it and, and engage. Uh, all right. Um, you know, still tons of questions, but that's great. Uh, maybe Ilan will do, once the book comes out, a Q&A, a live Q&A or something like that. We'll have him back on the show and we'll just do a Q&A. We'll let you call up with all your questions, uh, friendly and obnoxious as they might be, and let you, uh, uh, let you, uh, let you, uh, let you uh, express yourselves and, and let Ilan answer their questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, follow Ilan. What else do I want to tell you? I want to tell you to support uh, me on Patreon. Um, go to the Ayn and, uh, you know, go study objectivism. You can get to campus there. You can support the institute there. You can, uh, you can see what Ayn Rand wrote about a lot of these issues. Somebody asked a question about what does objectivism have to do with some violent conflict on the other side of the world? Well, go read Ayn Rand writing about all kinds of conflict, all kinds of issues, the Vietnam War, about, uh, about uh, Nixon going to China, about lots of political issues. Uh, just if objectivism is a philosophy, and it applies to pretty much everything out there in the world. So, so go and engage with Ayn Rand's material directly. A lot of it's available for free on campus or by virtue of selfishness or capitalism, the unknown, uh, unknown ideal. Um, Patreon, don't forget to support me on Patreon. Let's see, uh, like me on uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And subscribe on YouTube, all right? Ilan, congratulations on the book. And uh, thank you for doing the show today. And I'm sure we'll have you on again once the book is published uh, to talk more and, and to take listener questions. Thanks, Thanks for having me, Yaron. It's been fun. Bye. Bye.